What is going on, everybody? My name is Zealot Prince, and welcome back to another reaction video. We are now we are on reaction video number fifty-four, and we are going to be reacting yet to yet another SCP animation by SCP Animated. I am really enjoying these guys' animations. I really am, and I'm gonna get to continue to react to their videos from now on. And I've already seen a few of their other videos off camera, besides the two that I've just recorded, and you guys will see in the next few days. Um. But uh, this is the last reaction video I'll be recording for this day, and I'll be recording on Tuesday, which is probably already passed by the time this video is coming out. But um, yeah, anyway, we're going to be reacting to The Hunt for the Hard to Destroy Reptile, SCP-682. If you guys don't know what SCP-682, it's a reptilian-like creature that cannot be destroyed. It can be, I mean, it can be injured, but it can't be blown up or killed in any way, because it kept, just keeps regenerating. It is, it's, it's an intelligent keter class. SCP that wants to wipe out humanity for unknown reasons. It just wants, it just hates humanity for some reason. And uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and click play on this bad boy in three, two, one, go. May 14th. May 14th, oh, 1883. I received a most curious missive in the post this morning. It has been four months since I returned to England, having nearly lost my life in endeavoring to become the first man to reach the summit of the foreboding and deadly Mount Everest. I have spent the time since in research and recovery here in London, nursing my wounds and documenting my memoirs of the harrowing trip up the mountain and my nearly fatal encounter with the creature I found there, and have not planned to embark again for distant shores until after summer has passed. That has changed, I fear, as the result of today's letter. To Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, CBE. Colonel Joseph Teofante, the Armée de Terre of the Republic of France, does hereby cordially invite you to participate in the hunt of a great and terrible creature that threatens the lives of thousands. The Tarask, a creature great and terrifying, of late believed to be legend, has risen and threatens the security of the land of province and France itself. Colonel Deafante has been authorized by the President of the Republic to pay a sum of five million English pounds to the man or men who shall slay this infamous beast. <laughs> a million dollars I immediately is dashed off an acceptance and sent it out with the afternoon post. I have always been a firm believer in the proposition that even in the most preposterous of myths, there lies a kernel of truth. Whether an ancient behemoth that breathed fire was bringing ruination to the south of France, I knew not. But I knew that the army and the president themselves were concerned enough to seek out a man such as myself, and were willing to offer a bounty that would finance a score of proper expeditions for the killing of a single beast. May 20th, 1883. You're for a hell of a We disembarked away, in Avignon. Mr. Roosevelt and I spent many hours sharing our tales of adventure. I find in him a true intellectual who understands what it means to be a naturalist. Mr. Dukov I found more difficult to talk to. He is a private man who prefers the company of his books and his studies to that of his fellows. I did my best to avoid speaking to Mr. Harris during the trip. I intend during our expedition to be no less than a gentleman, but the man leaves a sour taste in my mouth. May 21st, 1883. Avignon itself looked like a city at war. Soldiers patrolling the streets, barricades at the edge of town. Not far outside the city, we reached the edge of the quarantine zone. Soldiers had been hard at work digging trenches, erecting fortifications. The young men keeping watch looked battle-scarred, as though they had seen indescribable horror. I asked on passing if any of them had yet seen the Tarasque. Only a few, the scouts and lookouts, had seen it from a distance, I was told, for nobody who had engaged the beast at close range was still alive. We set up camp on the edge of the dead town. Mr. Harris returned by evening and informed us he had spotted the Tarasque to the southwest, near the village of Belgard, in the act of destroying a farmhouse. Yeah, and there's the farmhouse story. Difficult to trace, for a swath of barren land seemed to lay a trail. Even the grass itself was not safe from the Tarasque wrath. Tomorrow we will follow the trail and engage the beast. May 22nd, 1883. Shortly after midday, he we is. spotted the creature in the distance. It was stationary, seeming to nap in the yeah, afternoon CP sun. It was a massive thing, longer than a well, and taller than a giraffe, and it looked to outweigh either. Its scales glistened in the sun, and its teeth, massive and shining, were bad as it rested among the chaos it had wrought. Had it wings, I would have called it a dragon. With our weapons in tow, we stealthily approached the beast to a range of less than 30 meters. We drew straws, and it was agreed I would take the first shot at the abomination. Steadying my gun against the fence, I took careful aim for the sleeping Taras' head. I held my breath, made my final adjustment, and fired. 
We watched with delight as the top of the terrace head was shorn clean off. The beast slumped to the ground, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Mr. Harris let out a cheer, and the dead beast came to life. Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Harris barely had time to fire around each at the beast before we were forced to scatter. We watched in horror as the wounds it took sealed themselves within seconds. We were able to elude the Goliath, and by nightfall we were among the soldiers at the barricade, our prides injured but otherwise in good health. May 28th, 1883. Jesus. After our second attempt to attack the Tarasque on the 23rd proved no more successful than the first, we have come to a conclusion that the beast cannot be killed simply by gunshot, or electrification, or setting it aflame, for the rate at which it heals its injuries is so great, and its tolerance for pain and mutilation so high, that even the mighty broadsides of the Royal Navy would have little chance of destroying it before it could take their lives in trade. To slay the Tarasque, we determined, we would have to immobilize it, and deal such destruction upon it that it would be utterly annihilated before it could free itself. We prepared our trap in the fields near Gravesome, a village between Tarascan and Avignon that the Tarasque had yet to lay waste to. We had judged that the beast stood about nine feet at the shoulder, six feet wide and thirty feet long. We dug a long trench in the field wide and long enough to contain the beast, and deep enough to stop the beast climbing loose before the damage could be done. In the bottom of the pit, we mounted steel rods, sharpened to a fine point by the hundreds, each tipped with the noxious poison I had acquired in the Orient. Mr. Roosevelt has agreed to act this as thing doesn't, He will approach the Tarasque doesn't die. horseback and attack it with his elephant gun. Once it gives chase, he will lure it to the pit. Providence was standing, nothing shall be left of the creature but ash and bone by sundown tomorrow. May 29th, 1883. Success! The plan went off without a hitch. It was afternoon before Mr. Roosevelt could coerce the Tarasque into pursuing him, but surely enough, the reptilian behemoth fell into the pit, impaled upon the spikes. Messrs. Dukov, Harris, and I, lying in wait out of sight, joined Mr. Roosevelt at the pit's edge and unleashed the full fury of our armaments onto it. Our rifles and shotguns, the particle destabilizer, Mr. Dukov's electric rifle, and the pitch blend gun. The monster let loose a screech from the pits of damnation itself, as bullets and explosives tore its flesh loose, bit by bit, and jellied kerosene burned slowly and stopped it regrowing. By the time the fires had died down, a charred skeleton was all that remained. We have separated the beast's massive skull, blackened and perforated, from what remains of the monster, and a handful of soldiers regenerate. are hard at work, filling in the pit with earth. Tomorrow we shall bring the skull back to Avignon and collect our reward. May 30th, 1883. We were hailed as heroes by the army when we arrived in Avignon with our prize. In the morning light, the Taras skull seemed whiter than it had the night before, and more charred flesh stuck to it than it had seemed when we dragged it from the pit, though surely it was little more than an illusion. The four of us posed for photographs, and Mr. Dukov asked to have his photograph taken with his head in between the massive jaws of our fallen prey. Imagine our horror when the jaws snapped shut, severing Dukov's head neatly at the shoulders. The skull of the Tarask rolled loose from its place on the stage and snapped again, taking another chunk of his body, and the soldiers screamed and fainted as it seemed to be growing a new coating of flesh and scales over its charred exterior. We watched, shocked, as the honor guards fired a volley at the skull. The chips it took off seemed to replace themselves instantly, and I was dumbfounded as sinew and muscles seemed to spread across the creature's bones and knit into shape. The jaws of the disembodied Tarasque opened, and it shouted in French, The rest of the Tarasque, covered in earth and grime, held together by a few lonely strands of muscle, lurched through the square with uncanny speed, trampling men in its path, ignoring gunshot and cannon fire as it made to rejoin its head. Mr. Roosevelt and I had no desire to see what happened next. We retreated into the vault as a blinding light filled the square, and a blistering wind, mightier than the hurricanes of the Caribbean, slammed the door shut and sealed us within. June 13th, 1883. Providence smiled upon us after all in the end. On the morning of the 1st, the vault door opened and I regarded a major of the army and a company of men searching for survivors. At least 10,000 were incinerated when Avignon was consumed by flame. Even those who had survived, I learned, had been burned or blinded, and pitch blend fever will likely claim many of them in time. Mm. We were two of only a handful of witnesses to one of the greatest disasters to strike France in recent memory, and having been at the center of it all, the army regarded us with great suspicion. Mr. Roosevelt and I parted ways in Calais. He intends to return to America, he informed me, and pursue a political career. In that oh, wait, so that was well. Teddy Roosevelt that was with them. But supposed I to be Teddy to my Roosevelt. House in London this afternoon and was informed by deeds that a postcard had arrived for me this morning. 
The handwriting in the brief unsigned note within resembled that of the strange Englishman who had attended the questionings, whose notes I caught brief glimpses of from time to time. I present that message below. To Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, CBE. The Royal Foundation for the Security, Containment, and Protection of Anomalous Objects in Phantasmagoria requests a meeting for the purpose of negotiating an alliance favorable to both our parties. Please call any time, excepting Sundays, at number 19 Melbourne Road, Westminster, and ask to speak to Dr. Thursday. Your discretion is requested in this matter. I have not heard of this foundation before and I do not know if I intend to take them up on their mysterious overture. Perhaps I shall hear them out, but I have never been one to serve in one man's employ for very long, and I value my freedom as a naturalist and explorer above all else. We shall see. Hmm. That's it. Okay, that's it. Wow. The quality of these animations get better and better every time when it's uploaded. Because so recently I noticed the um, the latest video with the one with the sculpture and the Siren Head video that came before it, they're using the mouth moving animations. Like the ones previously that I've, that I've already seen, they didn't, their mouths weren't moving, they were just staying in one place. But now they're actually taking it a lot more further. But this was a great SCP-682 video that I watched. I actually really enjoyed it. I also like the little Easter egg with Theodore Roosevelt, one of the presidents. I forgot which uh, numbered president he was, but I know it was way before World War One ever came out, came to be. Um, but regardless, guys, hope you guys did enjoy today's video. Like, subscribe, all that stuff, guys, and I'll see you guys hopefully in the next reaction video that I record. Bye.